Hello, I'm Jennifer Keller, Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library. Today, I am excited to be speaking with Janice Kapp, author of The Gene Women, From Overlooked to the World. Ms. Kaplan is a television producer, editor-in-chief of Parade Mag Magazine, and the writer of 14 books, including this one. So, welcome, Ms. Kaplan. Thank you. Pleasure to be here virtually. <laughs> Would you give us an overview of what the genius of women is and tell us what inspired you to write it? Sure. Um, I was interested, well, I've been interested in women's issues for much of my career, but the book really looks at women throughout history and tries to figure out how it is that despite all the obstacles women have had in every generation, some women have always managed to soar so high and to achieve so much. And I was inspired specifically to write this book after there was a survey. It was done actually by a very well-known pollster who's a friend of mine named Mike Berland. And he did a survey on genius. And he found that 90% of Americans think that geniuses tend to be men. 90% is a crazy number. If you've ever done any polls, you know you can't get 90% of Americans to agree that they like ice cream. You can't get them to agree on anything. Yet 90% said that geniuses tended to be men. And Mike presented those findings to me one day. And we also talked about the fact that when asked to name a female genius, virtually the only one anybody could come up with was Madame Curie, Marie Curie, with a few Rosalind Franklins thrown in there. So Mike said to me, what do you think is going on here? And I really had no idea, but I was completely intrigued by the question by why it is that we don't think of women as geniuses. And I pretty much spent the next two years trying to find an answer. Oh two years. <laughs> so your book also looks at the genius of women from the 1600s all the way to present day. And do you think these women got overlooked or are continuing to be overlooked? Um, but has that changed through this? Well, we like to think it's changed, and I think it has changed a bit. Um, early in my research, I met a professor from Cambridge University named Charles Jones. And he described genius to me as the place where extraordinary talent meets celebrity. And I was really intrigued by that definition because he's an academic. He didn't mean celebrity in a reality TV, Kim Kardashian sort of way. He meant celebrity only in the sense of not getting your work recognized, not being appreciated, not being seen for what you do. And for too long, in fact, as you said, back to the 1600s for much of history, and right up to this present moment, I'm afraid to say, women have had that extraordinary talent, but they've not had the celebrity. They've not been noticed in that right way. <clears throat> Excuse me, so as to your question of why does that happen? Why do women get overlooked? Well, I guess you could blame it on blatant misogyny, and trust me, I don't rule that one out. But I think it's probably something a little subtler. And I think what's going on is what psychologists refer to as confirmation bias. And what that means is that when you have an idea about something, when you expect something to be a certain way, you look for all of the information and all of the things that are going to support that. We see it in politics, right? If you have a particular position, those are the people you hear, those are the ads and the commercials that, that you follow. Well, it happens with men and women also, that we tend to see men and women in a certain way. Over and over again, as I did my research going way back, I would find women who had these extraordinary discoveries as recently as the 1940s, the 1960s, the 1970s, and they didn't win the Nobel Prize. It went to a male colleague, often a male colleague who didn't understand the subject in the same way they did, but that the men on the Nobel Committee just couldn't understand that it would be a woman who had made that discovery. So that brings us back to that question of confirmation bias. If you assume that it's a man who is going to be the leader, it's a man who's going to be the genius, that's what you look for. And that's what you find. And when it's a woman who does it, she just gets ignored because we sort of can't even see that that's what's going on. And by the way, let me add just one other thing to that, which is that we often blame men for this and assume that it's a male problem. But I found over and over again that it's women who do it to ourselves as much as anybody else does. There's an old line that says, it's not just that we live in a patriarchy, but the patriarchy lives in us. 
And I think for too many women, that's so much the case that we believe those expectations. We believe that and we have our own confirmation bias. Mm. Would you give me an example of one of those women who was completely over? I know your book mentions a few. <laughs> sure. Well, there's a story uh, back in the 1940s of a, a physicist named Lise Meitner. And uh, Lise Meitner actually discovered nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is kind of a big deal. Um, it's what led to nuclear energy. It's what led, alas, to nuclear weapons, which she refused to have anything to do with. Um, it really turned physics on its head. And um, the discovery won the Nobel Prize. I say the discovery won the Nobel Prize because Lise Meitner did not win the Nobel Prize. It went to her lab partner, a chemist named Otto Hahn. Now, from what I understand, Otto Hahn was a perfectly nice man and a very good chemist. And he might have even deserved the Nobel Prize for something else, but not for nuclear fission, which even Lise Meitner, who remained a good friend of his for her whole life, but even Lise Meitner said he never really understood nuclear fission. But as we were saying before, the men on the Nobel Committee also didn't understand that a woman could have made that discovery. And they fell back into that old image of she must be the woman behind the man. Mm. Okay, well, so in your book, you provide many stories about weaknesses of the past and of the present. Um, you interviewed so many amazing women who are working right now. Um, and you identified traits that many of them have in common through, throughout the centuries. Would you share those and explain how those traits really help them achieve their goals and get through all of the mumbo jumbo? <laughs> Sure. Um, well, I, I did interview, I was lucky enough to interview some really extraordinary women and uh, to find genius truly at work uh, in America and elsewhere. Genius by its very definition means that you are unique, that you're doing something nobody else has done. But as you said, as I interviewed so many of them, I was able to find some traits that they had in common. One of the first was blinders to bias. Now look, there are a lot of structural problems in society that keep women back, and I would never suggest otherwise. But I was very struck to discover that over and over again, the women who succeeded, the women who were the geniuses, who had the breakthroughs, just never noticed those, those obstacles. They had absolute blinders on their way up. A couple of examples, Joe Dunkley, who is a tenured professor of physics at Princeton, a lovely young woman, as it happens, uh, quite brilliant and won, has won all sorts of um, amazing awards already early in her career, a great genius. And she told me that when she was an undergraduate at Oxford, it never occurred to her that she was the only woman in her physics class. She just never noticed. And so she never was intimidated about raising her hand or speaking out, as so many women say they are. Blinders to bias, she just didn't notice. Her counterpart at Yale, a woman named Meg Yuri, who's the head of the physics department at Yale, um, actually she was the first woman to be so, and by the way, this is 2020, I cannot tell you how many women I interviewed who were the first in something. Um, but nonetheless, Meg started out as a NASA scientist before she went to Yale. And she told me that when she was a young woman, a young girl, she looked up and she realized that she had no role models. There were no women doing what she wanted to do. And so instead of thinking that that was an obstacle that meant she couldn't do it, she said she used to tell herself, oh, I know what it must be. It must just be that there are no women who ever wanted to do this. And she said, now looking back, she realizes that, of course, that was baloney. Of course, there were women who wanted to, but they didn't know how to get over those obstacles. But once again, that blinder to bias, that not seeing the obstacle. Now, the other side of that story, which is really, really important to say, is that women like Joe Dunkley and Meg Yuri, once they get in the positions where they can do something, where they can change those obstacles, where they can make a difference, they do. And both of them are extraordinary advocates for women and helping other women and, and being role models and trying to, to get, get rid of those obstacles. But sometimes until you get to the position where you can actually do that, you have to just ignore them. Um, one of the other things I found, and that is a sort of a side uh, line to that, is an ability to overlook gender. 
uh, Tina Landau, who's a Broadway director and a wonderful Broadway director, told me that she never likes to be referred to as a woman director. She is a woman who directs. Now, it sounds like the same thing, but it's really a big difference. If you describe yourself as a woman director, you're suggesting that all women fit into the same category. And we do that over and over again. We talk about a woman scientist or a woman politician or a woman leader. And we're suggesting again that they all function the same. They don't. Tina Landau is a wonderful director. She's a wonderful woman, but the two have very little to do with each other. And I think that it's so important that we realize that. Sometimes the old stereotypes, you know, that I mentioned before of the woman behind the man, we just replace the old stereotypes with new stereotypes. So what we say now is that women are collegial and cooperative, and we mean that in a positive way. It's just as ridiculous as the old stereotype. We all know women who are leaders, women who are loners, and women who are collegial. We know men who are leaders, who are loners, and who are collegial. We have to get over suggesting or thinking to ourselves or to anyone else that there's a group mentality for 50% of the world that's men and 50% of the world that's women. Um, let me mention one other uh, common theme that I found, which was positivity. Now look, I wrote the gratitude diaries. Um, I find positivity in everything, I understand that. But I never met a more upbeat, positive group of women than the genius women that I interviewed. Uh, one of the women uh, was uh, Dr. Frances Arnold, who's in California and um, did win the Nobel Prize in chemistry a couple of years ago. And she's an extraordinary woman. And because it takes so long to win the Nobel Prize, um, early in her career, when she was doing her work, which was a new way of creating enzymes in the laboratory, which she called uh, directed evolution, it was going to completely upend how chemistry was done, how chemicals and, and uh, enzymes were created. And everybody was telling her she was crazy, that she couldn't do it, that this was wrong, and to just give up what she was doing. And I said to her, how did you have the courage to go on? How did you believe in yourself enough to go on? And she said, I did not doubt myself. Well, I was blown away by that. Can you imagine what more of us, what more women could achieve if any of us could stop and say, I did not doubt myself? And that sense of positivity I heard over and over again. Similarly, a, a woman named Fei Fei Li, who is at Stanford, and she's one of the great leaders in artificial intelligence. She doesn't have quite that that outward confidence um, of Dr. Arnold. She's a, a, a young woman who grew up in China, but she had a similar experience. She figured out a new way for computers to see that's now being used in everything, including uh, driverless cars. And early on, once again, people told her, don't even think about it. Don't try that. It's not going to work. And I said, how did you go on? And she said, well, I thought, what's the worst that could happen? I could be wrong, and then I'll try something else. And so I think that ability to be positive, to not let people knock you down, and to see that you can possibly do something to believe in yourself, to have that core positive belief in yourself is really what crosses all of the fields um, of genius women and really is what makes a difference. Mm, great. So throughout history and definitely during the suffrage movement, which we've been investigating here in Westport, People of all genders claimed that the w primary women's role was that of mother. And many of the genius women you interviewed were married or are married and have children and thriving careers. And can you share with us how they're able to achieve that balance? And does that affect their genius or other women's genius? Um, and how can we maybe combat that a little? It is true that most of the women I interviewed did have children, not all of them, but most of them, and that might have been a sampling error. Um, they had children of all ages. Some of the young women I mentioned, uh, Joe Dunkley uh, had, has a little toddler, two little toddler daughters. Some of the women had, uh, like Dr. Frances Arnold, has, has grown sons. Um, all of them talked about family as being important and actually as being a wonderful balance in their lives. First thing, every one of them talked about having a supportive spouse and having a spouse who really split things 50-50. Most of them found that having a family actually 
improve their ability to work, to be geniuses, to do original work. And I'll tell you why that is. One of the women I spoke to was the president of Barnard College named Sion Bylock. And she also has a young daughter. And um, she's a psychology researcher, as well as the president of Barnard. And she told me she thinks that it's really important for women to have many different selves. She didn't mean that in a three faces of Eve kind of way. Nobody is recommending schizophrenia here, but in the sense of having many different things that you can do. So she herself is a college president. She's a psychology researcher. She's a mom. She's a wife. She's a friend. She's a colleague. And she said, you know, there are some days where she thinks she's just the greatest psychology researcher in the world because she's had a great breakthrough. And there are some days where she thinks she's just the worst mom in the world because she forgot to pack her eight-year-old daughter's lunch. And all of us have that. All of us have those moments when we're good at something and those moments when we're not good at it. And if you have that balance in your life, if you have that ability to fall back onto something else, to recognize that there are many things going on, I think it actually helps rather than hinders. Uh, looking back historically, I did find so many tragic stories, um, like of the uh, Mozart's sister and, and Felix Mendelssohn's sister, Fanny Mendelssohn, both who were brilliant, brilliant composers and, and uh, musicians. And when they reached their early teens, they were told that they had to go home and become housewives and have children. Well, could you imagine if we told Mozart that he had to go home and get married and have children? He'd say, why can't I do both? Why can't I do what I love? Why can't I do the music that I love? Or for some people, the painting or the, or the writing or the science that I love and also have a family. Men have done that forever. Women are doing it now. And when we allow men and women to do that together, I think we certainly increase um, the ability of what all of us can do. Mm -hmm. So this year, Westport has been celebrating and examining women's suffrage and activism. Since society still has a way to achieve equality for all, what steps do you think we can take to move toward more gender equality? I think first we have to talk about it as we're doing right now, and thank you for that opportunity to do so. Um, I think recognizing the biases that are out there and recognizing as you started off saying the advances that we've made, but also the many steps that we still have to take is extraordinarily important. I think also it would help a lot if we started integrating boys and girls a lot earlier and encouraging them to do things together. You know, it's, it's sort of mystifying to me that we separate boys and girls at summer camps and in school classes from the time they're four. And then we somehow expect that when they're colleagues and, and law firms uh, and, and businesses, they're going to see each other as friends and colleagues. So I think that encouraging our children to be friends with boys and girls, to have similar experiences together is really, really important. One of the women I interviewed, uh, Ann Wojcicki, who's the CEO of 23andMe, the genetics testing company, told me that she grew up on the Stanford campus. And, um, and all of her friends were mixed because of the kind of environment that it was. They were boys and girls together. And when she was in high school, her study partners in math class were boys and girls together. And she said it wasn't until she got to college, and maybe she was a sophomore in college, when some guy said something to her that suggested she couldn't do something because she was a woman. And she said she sort of looked at him as an anthropological, sociological species. And she thought, oh, you're one of those people. I've heard about you. And I loved that story because it struck me that maybe that was one of the reasons that she was able to go on and start a company in Silicon Valley and be an entrepreneur in, in a male dominated world because she just didn't see those distinctions. So let's do that for our children. Let's give our children that gift of encouraging them in all different ways and uh, encouraging them to see each other, to see each other as equals from the start and to recognize the many things that, that both can do. Oh, thank you so much, Janice. This has been a true pleasure for me. Um, and on behalf of the Westport Library, Westport Reads Committee for this year, I thank you for sharing time with us. Um, for all of you at home watching this, The Genius of Wind is available now for purchase at your favorite retailer or online on an ebook through the library. Um, so you can read it on your own and find out all about these Fabulously genius women. 
And for audios and information about the Westport Library, remember to visit westportlibrary.org. And be well. Thank you, Janice. Thanks so much.